Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. Hello, listeners. A quick note before we get to the story. You may notice something familiar about this episode's title. If you do, no, you're not crazy. This is a rebroadcast of an episode originally released in January of 2017. In a few short days, a new nighttime episode will be released that will follow up this episode. Since it's been almost two years since the release of Who or What Killed Bernie Langell, I thought it best to remaster and re-release part one of what will now be a two-part series. Again, an all-new part two will be released shortly. You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. The preparation for tonight's story brought back a lot of the feeling I had during the first episode of Nighttime. For anyone who's been with me since the beginning, you may recall my first episode chronicled an investigation into the vague details surrounding a UFO experience my grandparents had in 1986. You're about to hear the details of another event affecting one's grandparents. This story, however, ends with a mysterious death, possibly a murder, that may or may not be related to the development of secret weapons that were used during the Vietnam War. Obviously, this story is much darker in tone than the one I researched for my grandparents. Before we get into the main content of the episode, I'll first share my introduction to the case with you. Much like many of the other stories I covered, this one was brought to my attention by a listener. In this case, I was sitting down with a coffee and felt my phone buzz from within my shirt pocket. It turned out to be a message from a popular Halifax-based retail news and culture blog named Halifax Retails. In essence, the message said this would be a great story for the nighttime podcast, and he included a link to a series of tweets made by a Halifax resident named Bernie Langell. I clicked the link and found that Bernie Langell was sharing the details of an investigation into his grandfather's mysterious death. Immediately I was compelled and spent the next hour going through all the details, documents, and the photos that he shared to tell his story, and in the end, I was left agreeing with Halifax Retails, this would be a great story for the nighttime podcast, and immediately I drafted an email to Bernie inviting him to share his family's story with you. I'm pleased to say our guest tonight is Halifax resident Bernie Langell, who spent a lifetime asking who or what killed my grandfather. Uh, my name is Bernie Langell. I'm 33 years old. I've lived in Halifax, Nova Scotia my whole life. And in my free time, I've been researching uh, the mysterious circumstances around my grandfather's death. What did you hear about this yet? How did your, your family you know, share this with you? Um, I don't recall the first time I ever heard it. But my, my father's always been uh, strangely open about things that uh, most adults wouldn't be sharing with their children anyways. Uh, so I can't think of anything in particular that they would have hidden from me as a kid. But um, as a child, uh, I knew that uh, my grandfather died under mysterious circumstances. Um, they, uh, at worst case scenario, uh, they thought it might have been murder. Best case scenario, um, intentional neglect. And uh, in that it's never actually been solved. And the family's been frustrated with it for the last 30, 40 years. Hmm. In your youth, knowing that your granddad died under mysterious circumstances and knowing there was a story behind it. When was it that you learned, you know, how much there was to the story and how complicated this all is? Um, once again, I don't remember a precise moment hearing the full story, but throughout, uh, just catching pieces of it as a kid, my father would always, uh, talk about how, um, how his father, uh, had been murdered when my father was only 13 years old. His father was 36 and uh, in certain cases, uh, for instance, as a child going to the uh, Shearwater Air Show, we'd be crossing the train tracks to get there, and my father would point out that that's where uh, part of the incident took place. Hmm. So let's get to the, walking through the actual story, or, or you know, as much of the story as you know about at this point. So we'll, we'll start by introducing your grandparents. So at the time that this happened, 
just tell me about who your grandparents were, both geographically as well as in their life. Um, well, at the time, uh, my uh, my grandmother named Annie and my grandfather, who's uh, my namesake, Bernard, uh, they lived in Gagetown, New Brunswick. Uh, he was a member of the military there, uh, RCEME, the Royal Canadian Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. I believe my grandmother was a stay-at-home mom. They had uh, they had three children: uh, my father and his, an older brother and a younger brother. And when was it that this the actual incident took place? In February of 1968. So now let's get to the night of the event. So maybe set the stage for us. The night that this actually happened, what were your grandparents doing? Um, the the only thing that I know is uh, my grandfather had some company over. I, I don't know if it was how many people were over. It By the stories I've heard, it's always been a mention of plural friends. So I'm assuming more than two or more. These friends had been drinking. I've been told uh, that my grandfather at that point was not drinking, although apparently he had a drinking issue prior to this, but the stories I've been told is he had cleaned himself up at this point. Um, And he had turned to Annie, his wife, and said, Annie, why don't you go to bed? Um, These guys have been drinking. I haven't, so I'm going to drive these home and I'll I'll come back to bed when I get home. And that's really where where the mystery starts, basically, is what happens after your granddad left. So your granddad leaves, he drives his two friends home or two or more friends back to where they are. Now, based on what you've been told and and what you've learned in your research since, what happens next? Well, after he leaves, um, there's still a a, a blank space where people don't know the exact events. Uh, But the first known event is when my grandmother awoke in bed uh, sometime between two and three in the morning is the time frame I've been told time and time again. Uh, to the sensation of being wet and sticky, uh, she discovered that it was um, she was in a pool of her husband's own blood, and he was laying in bed next to her with his head bludgeoned. Um, when um, uh, she she immediately called for an ambulance, uh, in which case he was brought to a local hospital. I don't know if this was in Gagetown or in Fredericton, but it was very close by where he uh, was given some treatment, but it was determined that the best course of action was to fly him via military aircraft to CFB Shearwater in Dartmouth, uh, and then take him by ambulance to the Victoria General Hospital in Halifax. The, the next piece of this mystery, so the first thing we've, we've encountered so far that's unexplained is what actually happened to your granddad, but now we're already at this next mystery. So as I understand it, your your granddad arrived in, in Shearwater, got in the ambulance on his way to the VG hospital in Halifax. What, what happens next? Well, um, at, at the same time this is happening, uh, my grandmother uh, is flying down on a civilian craft, uh, lands at the Uh, Halifax airport where her sister my aunt Jean whom I've gotten a lot of this information from as well picks her up and they go to the uh, the VG site in Halifax when they arrive there uh, one or more of the nurses approached them and uh, and uh, expressed something to the effect of uh, that they were shocked about the accident that happened in Shearwater Um, when uh, when my aunt Jean or my grandmother uh, inquired about what they were talking about um, they advised um, my grandmother and her sister that the ambulance had actually been crashed into by a train. Um, uh, shortly after that, they they were able to see my grandfather, who hadn't yet passed from his injuries. Um, and the description is that he was uh, completely mangled by um, some of the debris from the the ambulance crash. But he was still he'd still made it to the hospital alive. He was still alive. Wow. After arriving at the hospital, what do you know about his time there, about the, you know, the care he received, what they were doing? In terms of his care at the VG site, uh, I don't know anything about the quality of it other than he, uh, he passed three days later. Um, it was during this three-day period uh, that some news had come out from Fredericton um, about how his treatment was while he was in the hospital in that area. Yeah, and now this is the, the third mystery. So number one is what happened to give him his injuries in the first place. Number two is, you know, the the story of the ambulance getting hit by the train is just bizarre. But now when your parent, again, when your, your grandmother is in the hospital in Halifax, when she learned about his time in the hospital in Fredericton, was that after he had passed? 
I get the impression um, that it was either immediately after he passed or in the three days prior to when he was still hospitalized in Halifax. Okay, so tell us what your grandmother had learned about your granddad's time at the hospital in Fredericton. Um, the the new story that uh, that um, my uh, my great aunt Jean uh, explains to me is that um, uh, there was a new story that came out in Fredericton uh, where one of the uh, nurses came to the media outlets um, to express concern that she had witnessed a doctor assaulting an injured soldier, um, saying something to the effect of "You're going to die today." Huh. That's bizarre. So the the unexplained injuries that brought him to the hospital. The attack by a doctor that, for what you know, appears to be an unprovoked attack to a seriously injured man, to be hit by an ambulance, to hit, for the ambulance to hit by a train on the way to Halifax, it has the makings uh, you know, of, a, of a movie, although it's very unfortunate, every, every piece of it. We'll start now getting into the actual details of the story. I, I understand you, you've been trying to piece this together and, you know, and find more find more information about what happened who, who is it that you've you've gotten all these details from up to this point a lot of it from my own father and his two brothers uh his younger brother which uh, larry has passed and then a lot from my aunt jean like i said my my great aunt jean i suppose uh my grandmother's sister who's still alive mm-hmm. also some information from other uh further out members of the family uh who remember the story well and doing my own research like uh, i've um, I've gone to the archives myself to find uh, the medical examiner's report. I've, um, I've gone to the archives in New Brunswick to look up uh, any available news stories. I've, been, uh, I've spent quite a bit of my own time trying to find information on this because as far as we know, it's never even been investigated. So let's now go back through some of the, the details about the actual events that happened. And you can tell me what you've been able to learn. So as far as the doctor who was you know, hitting your, your granddad, seemingly trying to kill him, what what became of him? What, what do you know about this? Well, um, I, I spoke to my aunt Jean about this because, uh, uh, once again, where she was looking after uh, my grandmother shortly after this happened, she had most of the details. But she, she also was quite uh, closely related professionally uh, to this doctor, uh, which gave her quite an interesting insight. Um, she, she knows that the doctor's license had been taken away by the Canadian College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, and she knows that he did go to jail. Uh, she was in a, in a professional position at one point, um, working with a gentleman uh, who was part of uh, some type of disciplinary board that after this doctor was released from prison in Quebec, um, he applied to and I believe successfully uh, got his medical license uh, reinstated. Now to the to the train crash. I understand there's there's a few stories about what happened with that. And again, this is the ambulance that was transporting your granddad from Shearwater to the VG Hospital in Halifax. What did you uncover about that? I never found any other information about it other than uh, there's an enormous number of people in my family and outside of my family that can attest to the fact that it happened. Um, the details around it are a little blurry. Some people have said or have indicated that the ambulance driver was intoxicated and crashed into the train. And some of the claims have gone as far as he abandoned the ambulance on the train tracks and the train smashed into it while it was abandoned. Uh, other than that, I haven't been able to find any type of record of it. So now to the actual injuries or, or whatever happened that led to your grandmother waking up with your granddad injured in the bed with her. Do you have any idea what had happened did they look into his friends do you know who they are is there been any information on on what actually caused this to happen Uh, the only information that uh, that i've been able to find so far and that anybody knows of um is is uh, the the working story is that he uh, either fell or was pushed down the stairs into the basement of their home uh, the evidence behind that is that we've uh, we've had photographs and have seen them of the the actual blood going from the basement uh, floor of their stairs up the flight of stairs. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the mysterious sort of thing is wondering how he managed to get himself into bed without disturbing his wife mm-hmm. while unconscious. 
has it come out who the friends that your your granddad was driving home were? Do you, do you know who they are or if they were questioned? I don't have uh, I don't have any of that information. I would presume that uh, that if there was an investigation done, they would have been questioned uh, in some capacity. But I have no actual record of what uh, what capacity that questioning would have been. And you haven't been able to uncover any documents related to you know a police investigation or charges aside from you mentioned the doctor. Yeah, the only one that I've been able to find is the medical examiner's report. It, did that give any indication on what caused the injuries? Um, nothing in particular, but it, it mentioned a lot of uh, things that I thought were interesting details to um, to follow up on. It, it mentioned a lot of um, very particular details concerning older injuries he had, uh, older scars from surgeries, tattoos he had. It, it described in great detail um, the fact that he had a, a head injury, uh, a massive head injury, and then it went into uh, injuries around the front of his face, fractures around his orbital bones, uh, fractured jaw, uh, stitches on his face, things that you would imagine could have happened from being struck in the face several times by a seemingly angry doctor. Hmm. Or it could have happened from being hit by a train while in an ambulance. The, these are all possible things that could have happened there. Um, but the thing that I thought stood out most to me in in the medical examiner's report, uh, considering the amount of detail of things that they mentioned, there's absolutely no mention of any sort of wounds or scarring or bruising or fracturing on his hands, wrists, forearms, or elbows. There's no defensive wounds there at all. So, um, which led me to believe that if uh, if there's a, a fully grown man falling down the stairs that's conscious, he's going to brace himself for the fall, but there's no indication that that happened. So as far as what you uncovered to, you know, to support that this all even happened, so you have the medical examiner's report, you have the, the words of you know, so many members of your family, which of course leaves little doubt. You had showed me the obituary. What else have you been unable to, or what else have you been able to uncover? It, this wasn't so much of a of a discovery as um, there's a, I, in my family photo albums we have record of there being a memorial trophy named after my grandfather that was awarded to uh, the winning baseball team in a local tournament up in Gagetown uh, and that was awarded annually for a, at least a couple of years but I, I don't know when that stopped and there doesn't seem to be any sort of record of that existing now. I, it's not one of those things that would have existed 40 years into the future anyways, but I don't know when it stopped and I can't find any record of it other than family photos of it. So we'll, we'll get into now some of the, I guess, the, the more recent events. Because we, when we had first met, uh, I guess a week or two ago, we had a coffee and you told me the story. From there, I went and did a bit of digging at the archives myself and I was surprised how little I, f I was able to find. So I, I found an obituary that I think is a different one than the one you had originally. I was really trying to just find things that corroborated the whole story. So I was looking for a record of a train crash because I thought that would have been a big, new big news if an ambulance gets hit by a train. That would be news today. Uh, oddly, I didn't find anything about this event, but I did find about, I think, two or three days before this would have happened – uh, a lady fell on the train tracks, and that made the news. And about a week after your granddad had passed, I found a news report of a car with uh, a woman and two kids being hit by a train. And they all survived. But I, just, I, I found it odd that there was no record of, of the train crash. I didn't find anything about the doctor, but that didn't surprise me because that would have happened in New Brunswick. And back, back when this occurred, the Halifax paper was very Halifax-centric. So news from New Brunswick may not have been able to make its way over but i guess the, the biggest thing that came up when i got involved you had showed me some paperwork relating to i think it was relating to your grandmother suing the federal government oh this this paperwork that i had discovered was um actually when my uh when my father and his two brothers tried to sue the federal government um for uh, damages or for uh, for information pertaining to the investigation into it. Uh, this was a letter that came from my uh, my father and uncle's lawyers, uh, indicating that they were withdrawing um, their action against the government because uh, in their investigation they had determined that my grandmother had received monies uh, from 
uh, some type of fund uh, prior before that, uh, I want to say about 10 years before that. And that seemed to have been a surprise to my father and his two brothers. But uh, I can't attest to uh, to that being fact that it was a surprise to them, but it seems like they, they were caught off guard by that. And this, this is what gets really weird is because when I was looking at the paper, you had it with you when we met at Tim's, it had the name throughout it, the name Chris Stiles or Mr. Stiles. Chris Stiles is a, a unique name, and I know one Chris Stiles. He was on an episode of, of my show four or five months ago about the Shag Harbor incident. Chris Stiles is a famous ufologist, the leading researcher of Nova Scotia's Shag Harbor incident. And I think when I had looked at the document, I said, oh, weird, the name Chris Stiles. I know a Chris Stiles is a UFO researcher. And I, if I remember, I think you said, I remember my uncle mentioning a friend. Yeah, my, um, uh, my, my uncle and my father uh, uh, always spoke of their good friend, Chris Stiles, and all the UFO investigation work, investigative work that he would do, uh, including uh, we had uh, home videos of him being on certain shows and some of the investigations that he's done. Uh, it, it, uh, it truly turned into be uh, one of those small world incidences. Yeah, because once, once we realized that, again, I'm know Chris through the show, so I figured I'd reach out to him. I had emailed Chris and talked to him on the phone just to say, what did you have to do with this whole story? And what I had gotten from Chris was he lived in an apartment with his girlfriend in Halifax. The apartment above turned out to be your Uncle Larry and, and his girlfriend. Larry had told Chris the story of Larry's mother who was trying to get money she felt she was owed from the government. Chris at the time was working as a paralegal and agreed to take on the case. Chris as a young man, I think this I think he said it was back in the either the late eighties, early eighties, whenever it was, Chris had represented your grandmother in a suit against the government that was successful and got um I I think it was a um a veteran's pension for your money that she felt she was owed when your granddad had passed away. Yeah, the, it was uh, it was kind of interesting to to that it came full circle like that because um, my my aunt Jean spoke of the late eighties and early nineties ish. Um, my grandmother, um, who passed in the late nineties, uh, she had uh, sued the government. My aunt Jean believed it was under the Freedom of Information Act to get information regarding her late husband's uh, death and in the investigation. Um, my aunt Jean was aware of the fact that she did end up getting a cash settlement, but it sounds like she wasn't 100% uh, sure about the fact that it, it sounds like it was actually for my grandfather's pension and what she was entitled to as her, as his widow. Yeah, exactly. And so I spoke to Chris and Chris uh, hadn't thought about this story. I think when I wrote him the email, he was shocked to, to hear this brought up because he hadn't heard about, you know, the Langell story since this had all happened in, in that lawsuit was over i think again in the the late 80s but um without telling him what you had told me about the story he told me basically the exact same story about about your grandfather's injuries the train crash the doctor assaulting him assaulting him he had all the same details only minor differences were chris's story was um he thought the ambulance getting hit by the train what he had learned or what he had believed to be true was the ambulance stalled on the train track. They couldn't get it out of the way. The train came and hit it. And I think Chris had even told me that the the ambulance attendants managed to get your granddad out. So he was like on a stretcher outside of the ambulance as the ambulance gets plowed by the train. But either either way, it's like all the details. It's like his version was very similar, just subtleties but i guess even within your family everybody probably has a subtle twist on on a lot of the details well it's been um it's been close to uh 50 years now so um if you you know the telephone game where you start off by telling one whisper to a person and you they pass it along by the time you get through 10 12 people it it's completely changed um uh, so it, it's understandable that in the almost 50 years that uh, the family's been repeating the story that there's some sort of gray areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's fascinating that it's um, remained that tight. If that's the grayest that this story gets, it's still pretty accurate. And I think it carries a lot of weight to its accuracy. Yeah. So the thing that Chris had told me that really made me agitate it was... He had, he had told me, if you want to confirm the details of the story and know exactly what happened, what you need to find is your uncle Larry's folder. 
he had told me that everything related to the doctor being going to jail, the um, news newspaper articles about the doctor, uh, stuff he got from the Freedom of Information Act about the doctor getting out of jail, everything about the ambulance accident, as well as doc- uh, documents about the investigation into your granddad's injury. Your your uncle Larry had it all in a big folder somewhere. Turned out, though, that Larry, your uncle, I believe he had passed away some time ago. Uh, in 2001. And, and there's no sign of this folder. Um, not yet. Uh, if he left it to his... Uh uh, his widow, I I have no way of reaching out to her. I don't know how I would get in touch with her. I don't even know her last name. I only know her first name is Ivy. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a slight chance that this folder has been given to my to my uncle Doug, um, but I've been in touch with uh, that side of the family, and he travels a lot for work, and he's not expected to be home for a while. And when he is home, it's for a brief period of time, and uh, and I'll probably just wait to grab him when he has more time to actually relax and talk about it. And I, I had asked Chris if he, Chris Stiles, the ufologist slash paralegal that represented your grandmother, uh, <laughs> I asked Chris if, if he had any record of it. He's going to go through his paperwork and to see if he can find anything. Hopefully he can go through and find something because I guess the, the way I'd be approaching this story because I, I did something similar with my granddad's UFO sighting, is I was just trying to corroborate every piece of the story with some kind of fact that can be proven. You've been able to do a lot of it, but there's just so much of it is word of mouth without getting the newspaper articles or or documents relating to the doctor. It's, it's hard to find out exactly what happened, but it seems like Larry's folder is you know the answer to all the questions. Uh, it, yes, it, it definitely seems like it would have at least most of the answers. Um, and, and I believe you even mentioned to me that, uh, Mr. Stiles believes he may have even had a photograph of the ambulance crash. Yeah. He had told me he had seen the ambulance crash. I think he described a, a collection of photos, not only about the ambulance crash, but he did mention the one that you mentioned with the blood at the bottom of the stairs at the house. I think he described the layout of the house slightly. Maybe there was some photos in there. I think he even mentioned uh, photos of your granddad's injuries. I could be wrong about that. But he he did say that this folder that Larry had was a big thing that he carried around with him that had everything you'd want to know. I I would imagine my... uh... My uncle Larry seemed to be a, a bit more passionate about this. He he was the youngest, uh, so um, uh, this would have affected him the most. He, he, my father was only 13 years old. I think that means Larry might have been nine when this happened. Remind me again what year this happened. Uh, this was uh, February in 1968. The next strange thing or the last strange thing of it is a theory that I don't I don't know if it was your family who developed this, but your granddad may have been again. You you mentioned he was in the military. He may have been involved in secret weapons research. Um, I I wouldn't say involved with, but maybe uh, an accidental witness of. I, I have to admit this is a little far fetched for me. I'm I'm not into conspiracies at all. Um, I'm, I'm usually the guy that sits on the internet and shoots them down and sends link to Snopes articles and stuff and it, and, and whatnot. But, but my, uh, my great aunt Jean, uh, her husband, a gentleman by the name of Dick, he, uh, he was actually best friends with my grandfather, Bernie. And, uh, my grandfather, uh, was a bit of a, a crazy guy. And at one point in time, he, um, he used to steal, uh, or maybe I should say, quote unquote, borrow military uniforms uh, that would fit his best friend Dick and they'd sneak Dick onto the military base where my grandfather's job was to tear down and rebuild tanks and jeeps in the field when um, uh, there was many occasion where they would have to take these vehicles out to test them in the field and they'd drive them far away from the base but still on the base but just far away from the buildings uh, and they'd break down and have to walk back and uh, and uh, Dick uh, apparently on at least one occasion described witnessing uh, some things that would take place. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you fast forward 30, 40 years from now, and it's it's fairly common knowledge now that the American military was uh, testing 
um, with Canada's approval, testing Agent Orange, Agent White, and Agent Purple in Gagetown. Where, where your granddad was stationed. Yes. Yeah. And at I, that t- at the same time. Yeah. And when you had told me that that there was some talk of Agent Orange, I did just a, I won't say research. I Googled Agent Orange Gagetown, and there's there's a lot of information. There's people suing the federal government that were in Gagetown around the time of uh, that your granddad was that were exposed to Agent Orange. And for anyone who's unfamiliar, I don't know it well, but Agent Orange was a chemical that was used during the Vietnam War where they could drop it from planes, and it was a, a herbicide. It would basically just kill any plants. And I think the idea was uh, the Vietnamese soldiers were hiding under the trees and whatever, and they could just drop this from planes and just kill all the trees so they could see them. Uh, as well as it, when it would kill like the, the grass and all that stuff, it would just flood out areas. So they were they were using it at that point and developing it and storing it in Gagetown. I don't think it was long after the Vietnam War that any mention of Agent Orange was a big deal because it had harmful effects on humans. I don't know if it was cancer or what. But what is interesting with, with the Agent Orange being involved theory, conspiracy theory, whatever you want to make it, the way Chris Stiles explained to me is that the doctor who assaulted your grandfather, which Chris Stiles said there's no question that's absolutely true, that happened on the military base. And at the time, the doctor that did this, Chris said, was a high-ranking person within within the military. I don't know the the name is a corporal or captain or something, but he was a, a big deal on the on the military base. And if anyone wanted to hide a secret, that doctor would have been either you know best buds with them or maybe their direct underling so you never know no you you, you don't and um and like i said it, it, it that's the thing that's sort of uh still up in the air is what put my grandfather in the hospital in the first place like i said when you see when when i read the medical examiner's report and there's no indication of defensive wounds or bracing to fall uh my first idea is that if he fell down the stairs, he wasn't conscious when he started, uh, or maybe even uh, as far-fetched as the falling down the stairs was just a way to disguise that someone struck him in the back of the head, because those are two ways to get a head injury without break, without having a defensive wound. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, there, there's certainly some mysteries there. Because um, they lived on the base where, where the house was. Yeah, they were right in, uh, right in Gagetown. Not that we think there's a grand conspiracy related to Agent Orange, but it would fit what you know about the story if somebody wanted to hide a secret that your granddad knew. As uh, as very much being an anti-conspiracy theory as anyone out there, um, I, I'm more against conspiracy theorists than pretty much anyone out there. Uh, it still seems to be the only idea that even remotely fits. Mm-hmm. It, it's the only one that you know people were covering it up because there's uh, like you said you, we've gone through the archives we haven't found any record of that ambulance crash but there's photographs of it mm-hmm. we haven't found um any newspaper recordings of this doctor assaulting uh, uh an injured soldier uh, but there, there seems to be some sort of legal documents uh, somewhere that back it up and, and everyone in your family as well as chris styles who i consider an independent to it it's the, the same story the only thing is that I think your aunt, as well as Chris, they described it as having been a, a big news story. I was surprised to have not found anything, but this happened so long ago, it's hard to dig up this stuff. And I'm in, in Nova Scotia. I really can go through the archives to find Nova Scotia news. So it's hard. I think a trip to New Brunswick would help. Well, I did that. Uh, at the beginning of this year, um, I found myself without a job. Uh, as opportunity would have it, uh, I was on my own and I decided uh, that I was just going to take one of those days of unemployment and drive up to Fredericton to go through their archives. And I went through every single available newspaper on microfilm at the, uh, there's two different archives on the UNB campus. And I must have spent five or six hours going through every single one of them. Uh, Then I found out that uh, I think it was Gagetown or Ormocto had its own newspaper as well. Uh, And I went to find out if they had archives on that. And apparently for some time prior to the event happening to my grandfather and sometime after, uh, 
they've lost all the originals and all the archived copies of those newspapers. There's just no record of this happening, which, uh, uh, once again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the fact that this happens for the same time period that the Agent Orange was happening at, at least made me think that there's a slight chance this isn't a coincidence. Yeah, it's, it's definitely weird. But when you, do, when you go to the archives a lot, I often see short periods of time, like a week or a day where, where it's just it's missing. You know, they just lost the record and it's just gone forever. But it's just odd that that happened in the middle of, of you know, of you of the story you're researching. Yeah, and it wasn't just a short time period. Now, they did tell me that it sounds like it was damaged in a flood, um, and, and that's what happened to it. But it, it's still, um, with this many things happening, it, it's hard to not at least wonder a little bit. If you want to figure out the, the entire story and get rid of the gray, short of finding Larry's documents... What what are your what are your plans on what comes next? Um, I, I don't have a lot of options at this point. Uh, I've been asking anybody that uh, might have remotely been at Engage Town at the time that this happened uh, to see if they had any information. I I don't expect to find any justice here at all. It's been forty odd years since this happened. Most people are either dead or dying that might have been involved with it. Uh, I, I plan on, uh, I've gone through and found obituaries of my grandfather's siblings to find out that all of his siblings have passed. And we have a very common family name. Uh, so it's hard to uh, determine that I'm finding the right next of kin that might still be alive. So it's, it's hard to find that. Um, in general, I'm going to talk to uh, more family members and, and uh, approach the uh, the Department of National Defense or Veterans Affairs to see if I can get a copy of his service records. And um, if nothing else, I want to find out more about his life. It's a man I'm named after and I've never got to meet him. A lot of my listeners would be from Atlanta, Canada. There is the possibility that somebody out there listening his grandparents, perhaps, may have lived there at the time. Gagetown would have been a big military base. Just to repeat it one more time, kind of what is the, the era that this, this would have occurred? Um, the, it would have been, uh, he would have been taken to the hospital February 9th, 1968, and he passed away February 12th, 1968. So if anyone out there has a family member who lived in Gagetown in the late 60s, ask them if they know Bernie Langell. And if they do, get in touch with his grandson, Bernie Langell. (laughs) What you heard during that conversation is as much of the story as Bernie has been able to uncover up to this point. In case it was unclear, Bernie and I are hoping more information will come to light, and if and when it does, I'll let you know via a follow-up episode. Further to that point, if anyone listening has a family member who is living in Gagetown, New Brunswick in the late 1960s, ask them if they know Bernie Langell. If they have any information, please get in touch with me, and I'll get you in touch with our guest, also named Bernie Langell. With that, I'll conclude tonight's episode. If you're interested in hearing more content from the Nighttime Podcast, please check out my Nighttime Podcast patron group, where for $1 per month, you'll have access to a monthly bonus episode. You can join by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash nighttime podcast. Without you all, the production of the show would surely be impossible. Thanks again for listening to the Nighttime Podcast. Please take a minute and give me a positive rating or review on iTunes or whichever other podcast place you use. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram where my handle is at NighttimePod. If you have anything to say, be it feedback for the show or story ideas, email me, NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. I love hearing from you. Until next time, I'm looking forward to talking to you again. Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.